This is a session about T Shark. So if you wanted to see a session about video formats and, and, and or uh, where the packets don't lie, that's other rooms. Um, yeah, but, um, I've got some trace files and the PDF, which is <laughs> did I put it? which are in the in this URL. So if you want to um, to look at it while I'm doing it, or you want to look at it later, you can find them here. So I'll leave that up for a minute. Who has started the packet challenge of this year? A couple of people. Did you use T-Shark or Wireshark, or what, what are you using? Wireshark mostly, probably, yeah. I try. This time I didn't do it because I only did the Q&A, so I, did, I tested it for, for Jasper, but whenever I do these packet challenges, I try to force myself to use T-Shark only to see whether that works. And yeah. Um, there's not that many questions, I think, in this, this year's edition that, that uh, really require T-Shark. Like, like in, in, um, in Berkeley, there were quite a few questions that could only be asked, uh, answered by T-Shark, so that, to me that's nice. So if everybody has this URL, let's get a little bit started. Um, a little bit about me. I, I started using Ethereal in, I think, in 1999, and in the last millennium. For, and uh, I've been developing since 2006, and, and for the last couple of years, I don't have that much development. Uh, I didn't do that much development, but I always have it on my list, like I need to do stuff again. But I'm really active in the in the community on the mailing list, on Ask and the Chark Fest. So it's uh, um, and then, yeah, of course I love the CLI tools. There's so much thing, so many things that you can do with the CLI tools that you can't do with Wireshark. Also the other way around, but uh, especially with post processing, I really like using uh, using T Shark. Um, so after Shark Fest 08, the first Shark Fest, the um, I don't know, I can't remember who wrote this, um, but there was this uh, uh, blog post in which this was uh, mentioned, so I kind of like that. It's, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a, yeah, that was my company. Huh? Shorter? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so these challenges, uh, like uh, Laura used to make them, and now the, um, this time it was made by Jasper. Um, they're really nice to test your skills and to see uh, yeah, whether you can find the answers. And in this presentation, I'm gonna. It, it's like the the, the uh, It's not about solving these challenges. It's about solving your own questions, and i just use these que uh, this as an example. To, uh, I'm not going to solve this with you, you need to solve it yourself, but I'm going to solve some of the questions from earlier editions with T-Shark. And um, um, to me, it's like solving the problem is nice, but it's an extra challenge to solve it in T-Shark. And um, in that, I see a couple of phases. In the first phase, you, you need to get an answer and, and for the specific, tra uh, specific question that you have. But I like to make sure that I rule out any false positives and, and or exceptions in the way I solve the, the, the problem. And also, I'd like to make it in such a way that it's repeatable for other trace files. So not only for this trace file, but for, as a general answer to a general question. And that makes it useful for different situations. Um, of course, it's easier if you have your Wireshark at hand to, to do some navigation and exploring the, the trace file, that's, that's, that's easy. Um, I use that a lot, of course. I combine using Wireshark and T-Shark a lot uh, together. Um, but if you only have the CLI available, it would be nice to also know how to navigate a trace file from the CLI as well. So let's look at a couple of uh, T-Shark options that can help you in that regard. So some of the uh, output formats. Um, who uses T-Shark regularly? Quite a few people who has never used T-Shark before. Good, welcome. And I hope after this session you will be using T-Shark. Um, some of the output formats can be really handy, like the, the, the minus capital V, it will show you a full packet decode. So it's basically whenever you, you ex expand all the packet details, that's what you can see with minus capital V. And if you're only interested in a couple of fields, instead of minus V, you can also use minus O, and then add the protocols that you want expanded, and the rest will be, uh, will be um, uh, collapsed, and 
so those are for human readable uh, format. If you do pro post processing, there's a couple of other formats that can be useful. We have the PDML format, which is basically XML, packet XML. Uh, we have got a JSON format since a couple of years. If you have a tool change that, that, that can absorb, J uh, or can, um, can accept JSON, this is an, uh, a nice option to use as well. Then there's the uh, electric, the EK, electric cabana uh, format, which is like pre-formatted to, to insert into an elastic stack. I've never used that, but that can be really handy as well, I'm, I'm sure. And the one that I mo use the most is the minus T fields option, because with minus T fields, you can select which fields you want in your output. So you have them in the tab um, separated format. You can change the tab to something else if you want, but you can post process that quite easily into uh, your, your workflow. Um, if you use one of the uh, PDML, JSON, or EK formats, you can uh, also limit uh, the output of, of the protocols to certain protocols with the minus J option. So in this presentation, I, I will mainly use the minus V, uh, the minus D fields, and, and work with that. Uh, one thing to notice is that uh, Wireshark always does a two-pass processing. So whenever you, um, you load a trace file, it will go through the trace file once, and then when it needs to display packet, it goes to the trace file again and display the packet. That means that you can have a look into the future also. If you look at these uh, examples with T-Shark, because in T-Shark, normally it will do only a one-pass processing, so it will go through the trace file once, and it doesn't go back to the packet when, it, uh, when it, it's trying to put it on the screen. If you look at the first part, where you don't use two-pass processing, it's just with a simple um, uh, ICB ident filter, you see that there's, at the end of the uh, packets, or at the end of the, uh, let's see if I can, like here you see that, that the TTL equals 64, and that there's no uh, reply in message. And if you look at the other one here, there is a reply in, and that's by, by using the minus two option for two-pass processing. And what that does is that some fields, like if you see in frame 3518, it says reply in 3519. You, you, that's something from the future. You can't see that when you're at 3518. So a couple of fields in Wireshark, they are only f populated by having a two-pass process. So beware that if you need to extract something for your trace file that requires two-pass processing, that you need to enable it in T-Shark to do that. Um, that also means, uh, yeah, that there's an example below that, that if you want to filter on the ICMP response in, you can't do that if you don't do any uh, two-pass uh, two processing. So that, that's a word on two-pass processing. Then we have got a display filter and a read filter. And there's a little difference in working between the display filter and the read filter. If you look at the first example, I'm trying to... Um, to read the file, apply a display filter, and then with minus C2, I say I only want to see two packets. And in, in, uh, in earlier days, the minus C2 would show you two packets, but in these days, uh, it will just load two packets from a trace file, and then apply the filter to those two packets. And if, as we've seen in the earlier uh, example, the first ICMP packet with this um, identity was in frame 3518, if I remember it correctly. So the, the thing to do in that regard, if you, if you really need those minus C options, is to use the, the read filter. And the difference between a read filter and a display filter is whenever you use a display filter, it keeps the packet numbering uh, as it was in a trace file, and then um, it will do the minus C. If you do read filtering, it will just read in the frames from, mem uh, from the trace file that's, that are uh, matching the filter. So if you look at that, if you then do the minus C2, you will see those two packets. And if you look at the last example, those were the frame numbers for these identity, uh, ICP ident packets. And with the read filter, you see that they're, they're all matched. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So all the packets that are on display, they match that, that read filter. So that's also something to take into account in your, uh, uh, your troubleshooting. Then one of the nicest options in T-Shark, to me, is the, the minus G, the, the capital G. And that's, some, uh, that's a reporting engine, and it can report on many things. As you can see, there's a list of all the, the things it can report on. 
Um, I'm going to take out a couple of them, a couple of them that, that are uh, really uh, handy. Um, two of them are the fields option and the values option. If you look at the fields option, it gives you a list of all the uh, all the fields within Wireshark. It's it's usually it's a field with um, it's a, a report with a lot of uh, fields on the on, on each row. But if you use the egrep to extract to just uh, extract the, the the fields, you can do it like this. So if I'm interested in everything that starts with DHCP dot option dot D and then something else, I can use this filter or this grep and I get all these options and uh, or these fields. And now I'm interested in because that's the first challenge I'm going to do. I'm interested in the, the values of these uh, of this field because a lot of fields have like certain values, and that's where the values option uh, that's where the values options comes in. Um, it will create a list of all the fields that have pre uh, pre selected options, and it will list all the options that are available. So for the DHCP option DHCP um, field. These are the options, or these are the values that you can encounter in trace files. And so now that you can look that up on the command line, you can use that in filtering as well. Then another great option is to, to look at the, the default prefs or the current prefs. In this example, I use the default prefs because it gives you all the protocol preferences according for, to either the default or the current profile that you're using. And I don't remember all these uh, profile uh, or all these um, uh, protocol prof preferences by uh, by head, but I do know how to search for them in this way. So if I look at the default prefs and I, I do a grab on the on TCP and it can be either hashed out with a hash or not. That's why I use the the caret sign hashtag and then a question mark. The question mark means the previous character can be there or not. Uh, it will list all the TCP uh, protocol preferences, and in this, in these examples, I will use the TCP.dsegment.tcp streams option later on in one of the examples, and that makes a difference uh, in how things are outputted. Like if you put the uh, dsegment TCP streams to true, all your TLS packets will be nicely reassembled, but if you put it to false then the reassembly doesn't work, and uh, the first part of the certificate is actually a f a, a, the um, a remaining part of the, the server hello segment. So uh, it, will, it won't show up because it can't do the reassembly. So be aware of your protocol preference also when you're doing T-Shark stuff. Um, who, who's using, I see a couple of Macs, but who's using Windows? A couple of, uh, okay. Uh, do you use like the um, the WSL, like the, the Linux subsystem? Yeah. In 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 Windows, you don't have a, a bash shell normally. So um, in the past, I used Sigwin to do to come over that to overcome that. And uh, these days, in Windows 10, you have the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is not quite nice to uh, to be able to do these things in uh, in uh, in Windows. If you're a PowerShell user, you can do PowerShell things. I don't, I've got no experience with that, but there's a session by, uh, by Graham about it from uh, two years ago that you can look up to, to see how you can do these things with PowerShell as well. So let's get started on some of the challenges uh, that I prepared. So in, in this example, one of the questions was, which hosts do not support selective acknowledgments? And then you need to provide a list of all these uh, all these hosts. So let's see how we can get that out of uh, the packets. So at first, I wanted to see whether there is any SYN packets, because I know from my protocol knowledge that uh, you need to look at the SYN packets to get the second permitted option. Uh, so I first started to see, OK, where is my, uh, do, do, do I see any packets that have sex permitted? So I used the minus C1 option, and of course, with a diff with a display filter, it doesn't work. So I needed to use the minus R filter, the read filter, and then it, it does work. So I do see the option. So we have traces in here that uh, have the option. Another way of finding the, 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 the names of fields, like I showed you with uh, T shark minus G and then fields, you can also look at JSON output and then uh, do a grab on the fields that you're interested in. So if I use the JSON output and I do a grab on, on SAC, 
I can see that there is actually a field called tcp.options.sec underscore perm. So I can use that field to do the, um, uh, to do the filtering on. And if I post process that, I read the file, I do two step processing to be able to uh, and I do a read filter for every packet that has a SYN flag set. And then I'm doing a, read of, um, a display filter for not TCP options dot sec permitted. So that gives you all the packets where there's no option, uh, all the, that gives me all the SYN packets where there's no option sec permitted. And those are the ones that don't support uh, sec. And that, then you get a list, but the, the, um, the question was to provide a list with IP addresses, so I need to post process that. Um, so at first I'm, uh, I'm gonna use minus T fields, and then I'm only listing the IP source address, which gives me a list of IP addresses. But I already see there's a duplicate, so I also need to deduplicate this. So I use the sort minus uh, U to deduplicate this list. And this is the answer to the, that question. So in this challenge, this was, I would have put the IP addresses and also the T-share command in my, uh, my answer sheet. Any questions about this first example? Okay. Let's see. Then the second example, there's a question, which device appears to be an iPhone but does not request an IP address for 90 days? So somehow I need to find in this trace file devices that appear to be an iPhone. Uh, so let's see how we can do that. So I think I need to look at lease times, DHCP, host names in the DHCP, stuff like that. So at first I'm gonna read the file and look for iPhone in the DHCP, op DHCP option host name. And since contains is a case sensitive uh, operand, uh, and I'm not interested in, in, in case, I use the function lower, which you can use to lower um, the contents of a field, and then you can compare it to a lowercase letters. So this is a case insensitive search for um, all the DHCP packets where the, uh, the, the host name contains iPhone. If I then do, um, uh, again I use the, uh, the JSON output and I'm, I'm searching for lease and then I see that the field DHCP.option.ip address underscore lease time can be used or is used to uh, provide the lease time to the, to the client. As you can see, th this value, seven, let's see, 7,776,000 is actually, a uh, that relates to 90 days. It's quite a long time for, uh, for these big leads, of course. So let's see how we can exclude that. And then I'm doing, repeating the same thing. I, I, um, I look for iPhones in the, in the DSP host name, and I look for that the DSP option, the lease time is not 90 days. And again, I'm exp exporting only the fields that I am interested in, which is the DHCP option host name. That of course gives a list because the DHCP request will be repeated, so it will have a repeated uh, host name is in there. So I'm gonna sort it again to create an, a unique list. And this is the list of unique IDs. As you can see, the iPhone was not, um, was not totally in, in uh, small letters, so it's uh, the, the case and insensitivity works. I'm going really quick. We're going to have a short session. Or, you, or we can do something from this together. Um, then the, the next Challenge, how many H3 redirections are seen in this trace file? So I need the trace file. Actually, I can do some live stuff, maybe. Um, I've got a trace file with uh, HTTP response codes, and if I look at just a couple of them, or I sort them, that I see that there are redirections. So all the 300 codes are redirections. So I know that they're in there, so I need to Extract those, in which you can use the, the range filter, uh, which I really like. Um, so now I'm reading this trace file and I look for any response code that's in the, in the range 
between 300 and 399. And that gives me a list of those, uh, those requests, or those responses. And then just doing a word count gives you the, the amount automatically. So in this case, any response code between 300 and 399 will be listed, and it will be counted by the word count. So it's quite easy to do it that way. OK. I think I'm going way too fast. Um, then you need to be aware of protocol preferences. Like I said in, in, uh, in the beginning, the, the, the way protocol preferences work is that they, they sometimes change the way things are dissected. And for this question, how many times is the HTTP response time greater than 500 milliseconds? Then the question is, of course, is that including or excluding the transport time? When you do a request to a server, the initial response time for the first packet of the response is the server response time, and then you transport the whole data, and then on the last packet, um, you've got the transport time and the response time. And by default, Wireshark uses, uh, uses um, reassembly, which means the HTTP response will be listed on the last packet of the response and not on the first packet of the response. And you can see that when you use the, uh, when you display this. So in this case, uh, if I look at the, the output with minus capital V to, to show the, the full dissection, and I only take the part of the HTTP, so the, only the HTTP part is fully uh, displayed, you can see that there's 55 reassembled frames in this particular uh, response. So you know that the, the, the response went from one packet and then to uh, later on. And that means that the time since the request is also calculated from the request to the last part of the response. Again, I look for the preferences and see whether, uh, which preference I can use to change that behavior, and that's the TCP D-segment TCP streams. And then you can see the difference between when you set it to true or you set it to false. You can see the difference in the response times. So for some of the responses, it's the same, because those responses are, of course, made of one packet. But all the responses that are made of se several packets, they will have different times depending on this on the setting. So depending on what you consider the response time, and that was not specified in the, in the, in the packet challenge, but if you do your own, if you're answering your own questions, you know what, which information you need. And if you need the response time or the, or the transport time, you use either of these uh, reassembly options. So if I answer this question with the uh, D segment setting to true, I will get an answer of 30. And if I set it to false, I get an answer of only two. So the, the question, of course, then is, which answer should you submit if, it's a, if it is a packet challenge? Well, I, I would uh, submit both to make sure that, that, um, that you covered all the, all the different examples. Yeah. Good question. I didn't. Uh, I didn't put a slide in that you can use minus capital C to select the profile. Of course, you can create a profile and then with minus C you can select it. In this case, I use the minus O option of T Shark to specifically set this parameter to a certain value. So I'm overruling the one in the in the profile. I didn't repeat the question. The question was whether you can only do this via your profile or also uh, dynamically on the, on the command line. And more questions so far? No. All right. Um, then when you process a capture file, and in this case it's what file was last modified on May 15th, 2017? And this question means that I need to have the request, because there in the request is the, um, the URI that I need to, uh, to find. And the response contains uh, if modified since date. So I need to make a match between a request and a response, and Wireshark normally doesn't do that. 
So I need to figure out how to uh, create that relationship between the request and the response. Of course, these days, there's also in the response, there's the HTTP full request URI, I think. Uh, so that has been changed. But let's continue this example because there's many cases where, where Wireshark can't match those and, and it's good to have a mechanism to be able to match uh, two packets that are not uh, in the same, or two pieces of information that are not in the same packet. So in this case, I'm reading the, the, the file. I'm uh, searching for HTTP requests or HTTP responses. I output the fields that I'm interested in, which are the, the frame number, the HTTP request URI, and the HTTP last modified, because those are the two parts that I need for my, um, for my analysis. And I just read four, four lines of the, uh, of the output, and I already see that there, there's a request in, uh, in frame five, uh, for slash, and the last, modi last modified time is somewhere in 2018. And the same goes for the second request in frame nine. The response is also pointing out that it's, a, it's an object from 2018. Then if I look at um, the full header, and please note that I used two-pass processing here because on the request, you norm in the one-pass processing, you won't have a reference to the field or to the frame where the response is because you can't look in the f to the future. So you need two-pass processing to know in, in this request that the response is actually coming later on in frame eight, as you can see in the red uh, marked uh, lines. So in this case, I have the request URI, which I need for my, for my challenge, and I have a reference to the frame where there's a response. So those two fields I can use. And the same goes for the, um, for the response in frame eight. So I'm looking at frame eight at the moment. And there you see that there's the last modified header, which you can use. And there's the uh, request in frame five. So I have a frame five with a request URI. I've, I've got a frame and a reference to frame eight. And I've got a frame eight that has the last, last modified um, field. As you can see, just, just at the, the, uh, the last part of the HTTP response is actually the request URI, but that's been added like not that long ago. So when I made this example, I didn't, I didn't use that. But it, you can do this simpler, but as I said, there's many examples where, where there, the information is not there. If you want to know the user agent, for instance, that's not in the response packet, so you won't be able to get that one. So. How do we match these? Um, let's see. So I first make a list of all the uh, last modified fields. And then I see, OK, if it contains 15 space May sp space 2017, I have the one that I need. So in this case, it's frame 27. But I want to make a general case. So I'm going to try to match those, uh, those fields. So I'm first going to say, OK, if, if I have the frame where I have the, the field with the value that I need, I'm going to print the request in. And then I'm going to pipe that output, or I'm going to use that output to create my new filter. So in this case, I'm doing like my own two-step processing. So I first extract the, 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 the frame number that I'm interested in, and these dollar uh, um, parenthesis open and then parenthesis close, everything that's in between there will be executed and the output of that will be put in place of that command. So let's, uh, let's do a little demo on this one because this is a very important technique in my opinion. Uh, let's see. So Let's see if I... So this is the first command that gives you 25. And I can, if I put it like... 
I can do it within an echo, for instance. It also puts out 25, but now you can see that it's really putting it into the, the new variable. And if I do it, if I then, well, if I then add that to the second T-shark, so in the, in the first T-shark I get a frame number, then in the second T-shark I'm reading the trace file again, and then I'm filtering on that specific frame number. And that's the, the combination of um, getting the output from one T-shark session to the next. And this gives, of course, a frame that I'm interested in, and then I need to extract a field that I'm interested in, and that was minus T fields, minus E, and then um, I can't remember what the, let's see, what was it? Uh, let's see, oh, it's the request URI. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, there's an extra space here. So that's actually the uh, the request that I'm interested in. Let's see, go back to the presentation. So, um, so I'll combine these two, and then. Printing the field that I'm interested in is giving me the answer, the correct answer to what, uh, what I needed to submit to the, to the challenge. If we expand on this, this wasn't the question for, uh, for the challenge, but if you expand on this, because I really like this technique, I use it a lot. Um, if you read this trace file and you're interested in all the TCP sessions that has a certain cookie value, you can use the same technique. You just uh, filter on the cookie then you uh, create a list of the TCP stream numbers, and then you use, uh, you, well, you can sort it to create unique numbers, and then you can use that in a new session to extract those from the first trace file. So let's, let's do that as an example as well. Let's copy this one. And I'm going to introduce a little, couple of more new commands. So what I did here is I read the trace file. I'm selecting all the frames that have a certain cookie. I ex export the stream number. The TCP stream number, uh, Wireshark uh, assigns a stream number to every TCP uh, stream, which means every TCP session gets its own number, which means if you follow, if you filter on that stream number, you can get the full stream of that of that session. So the output with uh, minus u, u would mean I get a list of unique uh, stream numbers, but I need something to put it in one line to be able to use the the frame number filter or the stream filter. So piping it to XR means I get a list of space separated uh, stream numbers. And then of course I can use that output, so I'm, again I need to, uh, let's see, I need to put this around it. You can also use backticks, but I kind of got in the, in the habit of using the dollar sign uh, parentheses. Again, T-shark, minus reads, NFL, and I'm going to save that to uh, extracted.pcapng. And then I need to create a filter. And the filter would be tcp.stream in. And then, of course, I can add open and close and another quote. And this should create a new capture file. And if I uh, t sharp minus read in the file minus uh, q set tcp. If I look at how many TCP conversations are in the original file, I get a whole list, pretty, pretty much. And if I use the new file, uh, extracted, there's only the couple of them that contain, where one of the requests contains this, uh, the cookie that I selected. So this is a very 
to me, a very easy way to post-process trace files, extract only the, the things that I need, and put them in new trace files to, uh, to analyze further. Um, okay. Then the next question, if there's no questions about this technique. The question is, what is the fastest DNS response time in this trace file? So now we need to do something with sorting and, and maybe getting uh, the head of a list and stuff. So let's see how that works. So I'm reading a trace file again. I'm going to look at the DNS flags of response. It needs to be one, because I'm only interested in the DNS responses. And it needs to contain a DNS time uh, field, which means it actually is a response where we have seen the request also. Um, you're going to extract the DNS time and uh, create an output. Then we create a sorted list of the output. And then you can post-process that, because that's, this is just a list. I'm only interested in the, in, the, in the top one entry, so I need to add head min minus one. And in this case, I want to have a nicely clean formatted answer. So I post-process it with set, the stream editor, in which case I say everything that, um, that is a zero, one or multi or zero multiple times, at the end of the, uh, the line should be replaced by a space and then the word seconds, which means I get a nicely formatted answer uh, to send in instead of just the, the, the time where we don't have any uh, value. Set is a really powerful tool to, to change text into something else. Um, you also, you can do back references, just like with, um, yeah, Let, let's do an example. Who uses set? Oh, quite a few people, OK. But if I have like um, something like uh, this is an example, and I would need to extract uh, the word n from this, um, or actually anything between this and example, I, should, I can execute a set command that says, OK, something this, uh, this, then a space, and then anything that goes between this and the word example is now put in, in, a, in a back reference, back reference one. So if I'm only inter interested in that specific part, I can just ref back reference to one. And this will be outputted like, OK, this is an example. If I put this is. Uh, Another example, it will extract that too. So it's, I use that all the time to extract stuff from output, uh, to delete all the stuff that I'm not interested in, or to post format it to like uh, the text in between was, and now you get a full answer. So you, you can use set to, to post-process your results into something that, that is human readable, or you can use for reports or whatever. Okay. So now we found the, the, the highest response time, and now we need something like the, the average response time. That's something, if you want to do this in Wireshark, like all the other examples were pretty much possible in Wireshark as well. This is something for a small capture file. You could do it, because then you can just add the, the, the response times and do the calculation yourself. But what if there's a 1,000 uh, responses in your trace file? You need something to automate that. It makes it an awkward uh, operation to do in, in, uh, in Wireshark. But we have awk on the command line. So if you want to calculate an, uh, an average, in the title, you, you can see that uh, you can use awk to do this. Awk is uh, like a programming language. And what awk does, it, it will read every line and then fire up the script uh, for every line that it has been reading. In, the, in this case, I, uh, I output the DNS time. So I have a list of, uh, uh, of response times. And then I can 
add them up with a sum function. I count the amount of things that I have. And then in the end, so after all the lines have been processed, I have an end re uh, event, uh, which prints like the sum divided by the count, which calculates an average. So in this case, um, this is your, uh, your output. And let's see how. Um, Let's, oh, where's, my where's my presentation? Oh. There. Like, copy. So that works. If I add here a print statement, so you can see that it actually does process all the lines. I can add a print statement that says uh, sum is now, and then something in the sum, or let's do it, and then count is now. So I'm printing uh, a floating variable, and I'm printing uh, an integer, and the things that I'm interested in printing are the sum, of course, and the count, and now you get, oh, I made a syntax error some, somewhere, let's see where, I think I'm, print have some, uh, so it's nice if you do a demo that you, well, close parentheses, where, oh yeah, after the count, I should close the, the print statement. Thank you. So you can see that on every line that it received from, from T Shark, it's calculating the stuff, and then in the end, it prints the, the results. So AUK is an, is an uh, awesome way of post processing your data, extracting data out of it, calculating stuff with it, and uh, do, uh, yeah, doing stuff. Um, So I can, like every network engineer in my book, should learn how to use Linux and, and, and a, uh, a couple of command line uh, commands because you, yeah, you can really do advanced stuff with that. Um, I don't think you can live without it, but that's just my opinion. All right. Um, let's see. Then there's one. What is the largest DNS TTL value seen in this trace file? Um, so I need to find how, which fields I need, and um, this is an example where I use the, the T-shirt minus G, and by default it outputs all the fields. So in, you can add fields after it, but by default it uses fields. Um, so now I'm looking for the DNS field name that, I'm, that I want to use. So first I, I grab on DNS, but as you can see, it's not a really well formatted or, or informative uh, list. There's the, the field types, there's, there's other stuff that I'm not interested in, I'm just interested in, it, in the, in the f uh, field name. So, oh, that's the wrong way. Um, so I'm gonna post process this, this is one of the reasons why I use awk, or one of the examples where I can use awk. In this case, I make, normally awk separates fields by white space, but in this space, in this case, I only want to separate on the tab character. So I add minus F and then the tab character to split on tab characters. And what you can see here is that um, the dollar five actually is the, the fifth field. And when I go back to the output, um, it's a little densely formatted, but actually the fifth field is the protocol name. So I'm looking for all the fields for protocol DNS. And then I'm pretty printing that, that I only print the, the field name, the, um, the description of the field, and the type of the field. So in this case, the print F percent minus 40 S means I, I print a 40 left formatted string uh, of a left formatted string of 40 characters, and I put in there uh, field number three, and then I have the percent s is the next field, is field number two, 
and be between the, uh, uh, the braces, I have the fourth field. So that gives me a nicely formatted field list of the things in DNS. And in this case, I was interested in the DNS response TTL, the time to live. So now that I found the, the field that I'm going to use, I can read the trace file. And when I do that, I see that there's multiple DNS response TTL values in one, uh, in one line. As you can see on the first, the first uh, output line, it's 176,7196,16, which means this field had three, this uh, packet had three fields, DNS response TTL. And since I'm interested in the, in, the, in the largest one, if I remember correctly, I need to put these all on separate lines to be able to post-process them. So that's where the command TR can be of use. With TR, you can translate stuff or you can delete stuff. In this case, I'm translating stuff uh, because I'm translating the comma into a new line character. That means all the things that were on one line will be put on several lines. And now I can uh, sort the total output into, um, and I can extract the, the 7196 as, the, as the, the, the largest one. And in this case, I can't sort it. I can't do anything with it. So you ex you change the comma to new lines, then you can sort it and you can get the um, the, the largest response uh, time. Then I'm getting back at the, the first example. Remember that I needed to create all the, oh, sorry, this is a, no, one more, one more in between. Uh, what names are associated with the server that establishes a TLS 1.0 connection with the client? So we need to find stuff uh, again. We need to select frames that are a TLS 1.0 connection. Um, um, okay. So we have the, the trace file. I'm looking for tls.handshake.type equals two, which means it's a, it's a server hello because we were looking for a server that supports only TLS 1.0. So I'm looking at the server hello packets. Um, and then for the server hello packets, I need to find something that has a TLS handshake version of 0 x uh, which is actually TLS 1.0. It looks like TLS 1.1, but actually SSL version 3 was the 0.3.0.0. So they're not really intuitive. But this is, the, this is the value for TLS 1.0. So I see that there's a couple of servers actually only supporting uh, TLS 1.0. But the question was, you know, what names are associated with the server? So I need to find, somehow find the name of these servers that I am, uh, uh, that I'm interested in. So what are the fields that we can use? We, we, we could look for a server name indication, an SNI field, that would tell me the, the name of the server. But if I look at that, there's no output. So you, again, you can see that I take the output of one uh, T-share command, I take the TCP stream numbers, I put them into the next T-share command where I um, uh, look at specifically those streams whether there's a, a server name extension or a server name indication extension, and the output is zero. So there's no server name indication in, this, in these packets. Then I might be able to look at it in the common name of the certificate. And I cheated a little by using uh, a Wireshark uh, output here. Um, but as you can see, there's no, uh, there's no uh, no useful name in the, in the, in the certificate. Then the certificate subject, there you have your, um, your certificate name, and I don't see anything useful, because the, what you see here is not a DNS name. It's not a, a server name. It's just a, um, a common name. So what now? And since since the, the client was uh, using DNS to, to resolve the, the server name and then connect with uh, TLS to that server, we can use the, the DNS uh, records before connecting to the server to, to actually get the name. 
And to be able to do that, we need to first extract the, the, the IP address of the server and then look for DNS packets that have that as a result. So again, I'm looking uh, at this trace file and let's do a, let's do a little demo again. I get. No. There's one too many. So these are the IP addresses of, um, uh, of all the servers that only support TLS 1.0. I can put in XARC to make a, no. XARCs to make a list. And then, um, and then I'm going to search for the DNS A record. Let's copy this because I'm lazy. Copy. So again, I need to put things around it. So I'm going to read again this trace file, but now I'm going to filter on DNS A records that are either of those uh, fields. So I need to put this around it. And I forgot to put the dollar sign parentheses in between. All right. And I'm still getting an error. Let's see, why do I get an error? Oh, because I put it in the wrong sp spot. So now I have listed all the DNS requests or the DNS responses that answered with an IP address of one of those servers. And of course, I can now use the minus T fields and it's minus E DNS dot. I think it's query name, if I'm correct. No, it's not correct. I need to cheat. Uh, DNS response name. OK. Response.name. And that gives me a list of all the, uh, all the names that were resolved. And again, I need to post-process this. So let's go back to the presentation for a minute. Uh, since I have multiple values in, in, the, um, in the output, I can again do the translation of the comma into uh, a new line and then sort with unique to make it uh, a unique list. So again, pipe translate a comma into a new line, which gives me a better list already, and then by sorting it and then uniquing it, I can have a list with only the two names that are in these packets. So again, I've got unrelated packets or like unrelated fields, fields that are not in the same packet, but I can take the output of one command, use it in another command to look something up in another place of the trace file by combining these two commands like this. Let's show the pretty poor method version again. In purple, I have the first command outputting the IP addresses. Then I use that as a filter for the outer t command and then post-process it to get the list as I want to. Then going back to the first question, because the first question was actually, uh, it was correct for this trace file, but as I said before, I want to make my my, uh, my output predictable in all cases. And if you look at the selective acknowledgement, uh, there's a couple of situations where uh, you can deduct that the system doesn't uh, support selective acknowledgements. And we didn't cover all the cases in our, first, uh, in our first try. So I created four new trace files. And, if, and you can see by the, by the name, SAC client enabled, server enabled, SAC client enabled, server disabled, CLAC clients uh, disabled and server disabled, 
and client disabled and server enabled in the, in the OS settings, in the TCP settings. And if you look at the output, of course, when both are enabled, you will see uh, SAC permitted in the request and the response, so there's no problem there. If uh, the server is not uh, permitting it, of course, it won't respond with it's SAC permitted while the client did uh, ask for it or did advertise it. But if you, and then the second example, of course, if both are disabled, then you won't see the SAC permitted in uh, either of those two packets. But in the last case, when the uh, when the client has it disabled, but the server has it enabled, you can see that the server doesn't respond to a SAC permitted, and it doesn't add a SAC permitted in its own answer. So if we go back to, I'm not sure whether I, uh, no, I don't have it here. If we go back to the, to the first example, what we did, let's uh, go back to the first example over here. Um, yeah, if you look at, if you look at this solution, you're looking at all the packets where a flag sin uh, is, e is one, so it needs to be sin packet or a synac packet, and it doesn't have the options SAC permitted. But as, as we've seen, if the server has, doesn't have it enabled and the client did have it enabled, uh, sorry, the other way around, if the client wasn't, uh, didn't have SAC permitted enabled, the server would not have responded with SAC permitted. And that would lead to a false answer that, that maybe a server would be listed here as not permitting SAC, while in, in fact it did, it did permit SAC. So and we need to uh, make sure that those are not ending up in the answer to make a definite good answer. So I'm going back to, the, uh, to here. So we see the exception. And... Um, if you look at, oh, I, I did use the, um, uh, so this is the, the solution I had in the first answer. And as you can see, in the case where, the, in the, the last case, the, in red, where the, the, the client was disabled, the, the SAC, but the server was enabled, then the server would have been listed as a possible, as an answer to which systems don't support SAC. And we want to exclude that. So again, I need to do a two-step process in my analysis. Um, I create first a file with all the uh, TCP stream numbers where uh, the client, let me, let me check. Okay, so the, the purple command in the, in the middle, that's my deepest command. I'm reading the, uh, the trace file. I'm looking for all the sessions where, um, of all the packets where the SYN bit is set and the ACBIT is zero, so it's only the SYN packets. And I'm looking at the TCP option SAC permitted. And then I'm gonna output all the stream numbers and I put that in a new list. And what I did with the, the blue value, the high value, was to prevent that if, if the, there's no output from this list, there, there would be an error in, uh, because there will be an empty list in the, in the, the filter for the second T-share command. So I'm adding a really high value that, that Probably never. Uh, I don't think you will ever read a trace file that has so many streams. So I add that in as a, as a placeholder that if nothing else is there, it will have at least a valid filter. And so now I have all the sessions where the client does support uh, SAC, and now I'm going to only look in those sessions for ser systems that don't support SAC. So that way I exclude. The, the session where the client already doesn't support it. Um, and that gives me, uh, so in this case, I'm combining for the second run. I need either, uh, let me point it out. So I need either, oh, this is the wrong one. I need either TCP flag sin equals one and TCP flex ACK equals zero, or TCP flag equals one, and TCP stream in one of these streams, and not TCP option second uh, permitted. So this means whenever I have a SYN ACK, or sorry, whenever I have a SYN packet, or a SYN ACK in any stream that has a SYN packet with uh, SAC permitted, in, those, in that selection, if the TCP options SAC is not uh, listed, I get an output. And then, of course, I use minus T fields 
where you use the IP source address as a, as a result. And um, in this case, you see that the, uh, uh, let's see, actually, I think, when I look at it this way, I think the 10.0, the 10.105.2544 needs to be excluded. So I'm wondering if this is really the correct one. Oh, it is the correct one, yeah. So it gets a little complicated because you're, you're working with uh, sets and selections, but the, the, the algorithm is I need either a SYN packet where I don't see a SEC permitted, or I need to see a SYNAC packet where I, ha where I have seen a SYN packet with um, SEC permitted, but now in this frame I don't see SEC permitted, and that's the result in this, uh, in this case. And of course, if you have a specific question, it, this can get a little more complicated, but um, at least this, this gives you the right results. So in my, in, in, I, I try to, to, um, to, to create uh, statements that are reproducible and that you can always uh, depend on the output of the, uh, of the command, in this, which in this case you can. So in short, uh, T-Shark, it uses the same dissection engine as Wireshark, so you have all the fields available that Wireshark has available. Um, if you use T-Shark plus some scripting, you can complement things that you can do in the, uh, in the uh, GraphQL in, in, in Wireshark. Um, and if you use a little building blocks and combine them, you can really uh, enhance, uh, or you can create yeah, wonderful things to, uh, um, to extract information from your trace file. Which leads me to you, if you have any questions about using T-Shark. Yep. You have to speak up a little louder, please. Yep. The question is whether we can trigger creating IO graphs from T Shark, and uh, I, I don't, I don't think it. I have never seen it. I don't think it's possible. We have some, we have some uh, statistic outputs, so you can do. Uh, let's see. If I use T Shark with, uh, let's say, NFL, oh, min read NFL, you have minus. Uh, Q for no output, and then minus C for statistics, and I can do an I/O graph on uh, with um, let's say one second interval, and let's, I'm not using it very often, but let's see. Oh, I need to do. Sorry, I think it's that. So now you have got a one second interval with frames and bytes without a filter, and you can do, uh, you can add filters here, like I want to have all the T IP packets, I want to have the ICMP packets, I want to have um, DNS packets, and then you get an IO graph or IO statistics for these three fields. And I think you can use any uh, operator that you can use in an I.O. graph, you can use here as well, but it won't create a graph for you, it just creates the output. But you can post-process that into something that creates a graph for you. Yeah, in, it's in tabular format, you get the same details. So it is an I.O. graph, but it's just in text format. And if you want to have that put into a, um, into a picture, then you need to use some graphical library. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? The question, if, if you use multiple files with a ring buffer, is there any way to uh, reassemble those streams? Um, not directly. Um, you, would need, yeah, you would need to use a five tuple to extract each stream and then merge them back together. Usually when I do something like that, I, I first merge all the files into one file because it's T-Shark, so I can load it. And um, then I extract the things that I need from there. 
but it's, it's not a perfect answer. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, what I do a lot of times is uh, for file in uh, and then uh, ls minus one uh, pcap ng and then do echo file to get a listing, then t shark minus read file minus write temp file. Oh, file.pkpng, and then use some filter here, and you can use your five tuple to filter. So let's do uh, tcp.port equals 80 in this case. I'm not sure if it's in the case, in the trace, then done. And it will create a new trace file for every trace file that it reads with this specific filter. And then I use merge cap uh, minus w uh, merged pkpng and then all temp minus files. And now I've got all the TCP port 80 traffic from all the, in one file. And one tip, if you filter on uh, ports or IP addresses, t shark is really slow. I would use TCP dump to do that. So often I, if I only need to extract certain IP addresses or certain IP port combinations, I, I use this method, but then I use TCP dump instead of T shark because it's much quicker. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Some of the values need Yeah. How does it work with the live With live capture, it only, but then you, can, you can't post process anyway. And uh, with live capture, it will just show you the packet as it comes in. Uh, and I think also that also happens when you use live capture in Wireshark, I think. I don't think you can see the two, two pass variables there as well either because it will show the packet as it comes in, so it doesn't know yet where the, where the response it is. So it's the, the same behavior as in, in, in Wireshark. Does that answer your question? Okay. More questions? We have time, I think. Let's see. We've still got eight minutes, so. Yeah. I, I've got a little um, noise of the air code behind me, so you, you have to speak up a little bit, please. Yes, it does. Yep. T shark minus, uh, minus R NFL. Minus Q set protocol hierarchy. Uh, I think there needs to be something in between, like uh, start, come on. No. Uh, it's in there somewhere. I need to check. Uh, endpoints, conversation. Let's see, conversation, no. You can follow TCP stream with it as well. Uh, I.O. Oh, that's it. There you go. It's I.O. comma protocol hierarchy. I don't use the protocol hierarchy that much myself, so I needed to look. But it is available. So you have the conversations, you have the endpoints, like I used the conversations before here. No, yeah, I used it earlier to, to, to show that there were multiple conversations. But you can also use uh, minus QZ endpoints, comma IP. And you get all the IP endpoints just like you would get it in, in Wireshark. So there's a, there's a, if you just type in something wrong, as I did before, you will get a list of all the things that you can extract with the minus set option, which is basically the whole statistics menu from Wireshark. Not everything is implemented. But there's quite a few things that are implemented on uh, T Shark as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, is there anything that you would not use T Shark for and use Wireshark instead? Uh, the question is whether I would use Wireshark instead of T Shark for some things. Yeah. Of course, I do most of my work in, in, in Wireshark interactively. But whenever I need to uh, get statistics of something, uh, whenever I need to automate things, whenever I need to post-process data, then I would use T-Shark. 
and a lot of pre, uh, I think all the pre, um, pre work when I do an analysis job is like extracting the things that I need. I do that with scripts in, in T Shark and a little scripting and not in Wireshark because I hate re repeating loads, filter, save, etc., stuff like that. Anything that I can automate or, or, or have, have my system do for me, I try to do with T Shark, yes. Yeah. Okay. But whenever I need to, like, I show you how you can get the field names out of uh, T Shark. It's way easier in Wireshark. So often I have T Shark open and Bar I have Wireshark open and use T Shark on the command line. And when I need something to look up, I go to, to Wireshark and then get it out and then use it in T Shark. And it's it's a it's a mixed thing. Yeah. All right. Other questions now? Then let's. Oh yeah, uh, Janice asked me to make you fill out a feedback form, which helps me also to enhance the session. Whether you things you like, things you don't like, please put them in the app so I can uh, make the session better if I do it again. And of course, if you still have questions, I'm I'm here at Sharkfest, so you can always uh, come by me. And if you have questions after Sharkfest, please feel free to mail me. I usually answer questions, and unless you're like sending me 20 mails a day, I think we'll be fine. Yeah. So thank you.